Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So thank you everyone for joining us for the latest episode of our virtual tech meetup series. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to be introducing uh, Paul Cowan, who's going to be talking today about front end developer experience. Um, before we dive right in, I just want to have a quick word from our sponsors. So today's webinar is sponsored by LogRocket. I'm sure the vast majority of people tuning in today have probably come from the blog. That's uh, where most people who come to our webinars are from. Um, so you'll probably be familiar with some of the content that we do, but we actually have a uh, production monitoring uh, solution as well. So LogRock is a front-end application monitoring solution, combines error tracking, digital experience monitoring, performance monitoring, infrastructure monitoring, and web analytics all rolled into one. So your engineering teams and your product teams can all have a single source of truth to look at every aspect of app, app development. So you can have a more efficient remediation of problems and iteration of your feature sets, in addition to integration with all of your backend monitoring tools. Uh, for more information, head over to logrocket.com and you can get a personalized demo, or you can sign up for a free account and just get a taste of what it can do for you. So now with all that out of the way, I would just like to welcome Paul for his talk, but just quickly before that, um, just a reminder that a recording of this session will be sent after the webinar has concluded, and it will also be uploaded to our YouTube channel so you can watch it uh, back at your convenience. Um, and we do have some upcoming webinars that I would like to um, uh, recommend people sign up for um, on the 28th of September, um, the 5th of October and the 12th of October. You can see all of our upcoming meetups. We have uh, webinars scheduled into November. If you just Google LogRocket virtual tech meetups, you'll be able to uh, go straight to the page where you can see everything that's upcoming. Um, now, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Take it away, Paul. Hello. So I generally start by stating the obvious, uh, and that is that I am Irish, uh, and as such, have an Irish accent. Unfortunately, subtitles were not an option. So if I do start speaking fast or incoherently, perhaps Jack can give me a virtual prod to get me back on track. Um, so we are gathered here today to speak about developer experience and developer experience with a front end slant. So you might be thinking, why should I listen to this man? What makes him an authority about developer experience? What, why should I afford him the time? Um, number one, I'm old, I'm 52. I've been around the block. I've worked in banks and local government and I have seen some terrible examples of developer experience. I know firsthand just how bad it can get. Um, but not only that, I'm also very active um, in open source. Um, I like to, as somebody might do crosswords, I like to try and get commits of a reasonable size into popular open source um, repositories. Uh, and in fact, the most recent one um, was actually uh, yesterday, when I got a pull request accepted into something I am actually very bullish on, but I'm not going to go into great detail in this talk. And that is the thing called Backstage by Spotify. Um, Backstage is a way of creating developer portals. Sorry, a great way of... Um, if you could just share your screen as well. Oh, sorry. Of course. Sorry, yeah, so um, I actually, so I, I've had a, had a pull request accepted into something I am very bullish on um, about developer experience, which is called Backstage, but I've learned a lot of good practices. I often find that open source um, is better run than the vast majority of, uh, of contracts I go on to. I've learned a lot of good tricks and I, I like to keep up with the cool kids to what they're doing. Uh, and if I have to get um, a pull request accepted by Spotify, for example, Spotify, huge company, they can afford the best developers money could buy. I'm gonna to have to raise my game to not only write good code, but I need to be able to communi communicate 
exactly what my intention of the code is. I, mean, I need to conduct myself in a, in a good manner through a, a very creditable and rigorous code review process um, in order to eventually reach the end result of getting my stuff merged. So if you want to raise your game as a developer, I, I can't recommend this highly, is to, um, is to really get involved in open source. It's not just about making the world a better self, better place on a selfish level. Um, it's gonna make you a better developer. It's great in your CV. Uh, and as I say, I've learned some really, really, really cutting edge practices here, which I can then bring into the workplace. So I've I've had uh, a lot of open source contributions um, uh, over over the years. Uh, I don't know, uh, where are we? Yeah, thousand two. Last year, thousand twenty three. Uh, alone in that year. Um, so yeah, I, I like to think I know. The front end landscape, not only from an observable letter level, I also am active in it. So that is a good reason to listen to me. Um, so what is the developer experience? So developer experience or DX has entered the acronym is now spoken about a lot more than it used to be. Um, put simply, we might arm our developers with the latest and greatest Mac M1s but if they're using these Mac M1s to copy and paste um, deployments um, from these high powered specs, then what's the point? I mean, the penny really is starting to drop with companies that there is an untapped gold mine um, of productivity by focusing on what is making developers slow and really greasing the pipeline um, and making, just freeing developers from the torture and toil um, of firefighting infrastructure and too many manual steps and having to go to stand-ups and almost apologizing for having to fight with infrastructure. So we want to have a, a really nice, smooth environment that, 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 uh, that really uh, that is really is a, it's good for morale. Um, it's really good for developer retention. So I'm sure we've all been privy to examples of bad DX and uh, I definitely have had my fair share. Uh, communications, often bad, we get badly formed tickets, a few, a few lines of code that are ambiguous and subjective, um, where developers, especially now in a remote world, can go off and develop the wrong thing for days before anybody notices. Um, deployment has got better, but the last really bad um, example of manual steps I, I had the misfortune of being involved in was a a council in Glasgow that will rename, remain nameless um, had its website split across four web servers and their deploying process involved putting a developer on each web server and giving them a list of English instructions about what needed to be done. So you can guess how error prone that was. Um, testing again now is more mainstream, but what may surprise you is actually one thing that can lead to bad DX is too many tests. Every test that is born or written comes with a maintenance overhead. Um, and the, the more real resources like end-to-end -end tests we might write in Selenium or Cypress, then the higher the maintenance budget. And if you write too many tests, then and I have seen this at first hand, then your whole, your whole pipeline can grind to a halt. Where if, if, say, you have an automated test team that rely on CSS selectors to, to grab elements to write tests again, then changing the markup can just break hundreds of seemingly unrelated tests. Uh, another, another thing we hear more and more about these days are flaky tests, people that, that has entered the, entered the vernacular. Uh, and there is nothing more heartbreaking than running the same test suite twi twice, once it fails and once it passes. Uh, you, this is what's called non-deterministic. De non um, to run the same thing with the same inputs and get two different results. And I worked recently in local government where we had a build of two hours and to have a flaky test just snap at 90 minutes into a build was heartbreaking. Um, until eventually lots of these tests just got bent. So 
this is another sign of, of bad DX. Too many bugs in production for poor turnaround time. Again, management is getting wise to this, that we really should be focusing on what, what do we do when we get a bug? How easy is it to create a spin up a new environment? Um, can we track the version? Do we have good traceability? Can we can we trace any line of code back to a pull request and get um, a source control diff where we can see the changes? Um, management are starting to know, but one good one good thing to do is to actually try and put a cost on um, any bug. What people are involved, the time taken, who gets pulled out of their normal daily routine, um, and Again, this is something that really needs to be snappy. We need to be turning our bugs quicker. Um, and another sign of bad DX, and I've seen this in a lot of the enterprises, is anybody who's a good developer, they get the hell out of there. If you're a greedy contractor like me, you're, you're going to stay around. But if, you're, if this is your nine to five job and you're just constantly fighting infrastructure, you're not working on the latest and greatest tech, then you're going you're gonna to head swift out the door. And I'm not going to... Why I'm going to make say something controversial. Um, what's life without a bit of controversy? And that is, I find not necessarily Scrum, but the way Scrum is practiced, I, I find it just leads to a accruing of of technical debt. There's total focus on um, getting things done in two weeks uh, at all costs. Again, this isn't what Scrum was supposed to be about about Scrum teams developing um, into self-serving teams that adapted to their context. But what has happened, uh, unfortunately, is that everybody appears to be following the same cookie cutter set of practices where we have crucifyingly long sprint planning sessions. We have retros where the same post-its um, get about good teamwork or too many meetings get put in the same spots every week it's really it's i think it's 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 old-fashioned scrum it's not going to it doesn't help us to develop our software um and we're also what can happen is that people start gaming the system projects where i've worked on a number of of projects where project managers have been incentivized to um have a nice flock of jira tickets um, go across the board and really irrespective of what's happening with the software. So what any smart PM will do is he will start taking less tasks into Sprint and any good developer as well will start padding out their estimates so they're not behind in every, every Sprint. So I, I really have seen this go wrong. Um, not entirely Scrum's fault, but more the way it's practiced. Okay, so we've looked at what is bad DX? So what is good DX? So good DX is this war on friction. We want to remove all the things that stop developers um, working on features. We, we don't want to be firefighting our infrastructure. We don't want to be struggling to recreate the uh, environment, a certain bug on a certain version um, has, has, has happened. So I would say that the five tenets of good DX are building deployments. A lot of DX actually focuses probably too much on building deployment. Um, it is only one, uh, one facet. Um, bug tracking and resolution. Again, you can suck people out of their daily life if you're constantly firefighting bugs in production. Testing, um, I think there's probably, and automated testing isn't there just yet. Um, and I think manual testing has become uncool almost when really manual testing still has its place. Um, um, we need to ob observe this and practice it. Uh, development environment. Um, it's important that you can onboard a developer. Everything, there shouldn't be lengthy setup steps or you shouldn't start a job and be given a list of things to install. Uh, I mean, the, the, we are developers, this, this should all be automated. And one thing that actually exists, um, I've got it as a separate thing here, but communication is arguably the most important part of good DX. And especially now in a remote world, we don't want to be 
veering off onto the own or leave things developers going okay when asked they have they're having to decide things from, from themselves all work items should be clearly specified so number one on the list is build and deployment um and i think i said i said previously probably see too much of dx is focused on this but it is highly important that you have a release formula um, that is 100% automated. Um, there should be no manual steps. Uh, you will create bugs, and then you will have to fire fight, and you you will you will spend time um, that could be better spent elsewhere. So the first thing for me um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, releasing is actually it starts at the PR level. Uh, and I like to have a pull request template um, for any for anything for not only new work but also bug tracking as well. We want to avoid this sort of uh, this sort of PR. Um, of course, any smart developer could, of course, delete the entire template, but they are at least prompted to do the right thing. Uh, and if I take my take you back to the pull request I mentioned, I have followed the Spotify um, template here where I've got a good detailed explanation of what prompted the change. I've got a nice UI shot. Um, and they've also provided me with a checklist um, that I didn't finish. And that's because um, I created another PR for the missing bits, but I, I was left, I was left not wondering what to put here. Like I, 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 I was it was black and white. I just filled in the blanks. Um, and then this is a great um, this is a great piece of documentation. Uh, and we and we want to make sure that any line of code um, we can use things like get get blame to work our way back. Any line of code should be traceable back to the pull request where we can see a git diff of exactly what's changed um, and we have a higher chance we can really narrow the scope of what's actually caused the bug so again i think this is often overlooked I, i've worked in too many contracts where a pull request is something you don't expect to get any replies to and in fact i think the code review code reviews have gone downhill because of um this get diff this this getting a, a link in an email. People are busy, so they just click OK. But what a good code review should actually entail. I mean, we can stop we can stop bugs before they happen with a thorough review of the code. So what I would recommend is you, first of all, go through in your text editor of choice um, with, a, with a senior, with an R developer of what's changed so he can find any flaws in your logic. And then, and only then after that, he can look at the get def or and get diffs, when we look here, we generally only find syntactic friends. It's hard to actually pick out the real intention of the code review. So I, I do fear that code reviews have gone downhill because of this way of doing of doing pull requests. Um, and I would definitely try and, uh, it should be a two-way conversation. And even you see that I, I opened this pull request on 11th of August, then I got merged yesterday. So there's been a whole back and forth here. And that's what a, a pull request should be. Um, they should be finding things that aren't quite right. Um, if it's done right, that there's something wrong with, I mean, this isn't a, this isn't in any way, this, is, this isn't a typo I fixed in, in their markdown files. This is like a genuine. So the, the, we can stop a lot of bugs before they've happened with a thorough and good code review process. Um, so we document change for credibility. We communicate our intentions. We also want to validate um, any commit to a PR should be running unit tests. I, I'm a huge believer in ES Lint for static analysis. Um, we can catch we can catch a lot of surprising things. Um, if you are familiar with React, you can't really use the React hooks um, without um, ESLint. But if ES, if you spend a bit of time to create a reusable ESLint package um, that 
your whole team can use, then it really does pay off in the long run. So we want to catch whatever we can um, before we try and before we release any code. Um, when it comes to releasing code, um, in Node, we have these infamous package JSON files, but we do want our developers to be coming here and update, updating these numbers because there probably are some unprofessional developers, I'm certainly not one, who would update the wrong number. I know that's hard to believe, but uh, it has been known to happen. So we don't want to leave any of this book to chance. So I use a thing, and a lot of people do, um, called uh, chain sets um, by Atlassian. So with uh, this is actually a PR for open source I'm involved in. Um, actually very good PR, a good example of DX to upgrade, to get rid of all common JS. Um, it was just too too much time is being spent keeping these two versions. So we bit the bullet and got rid of all the common JS and moved to ESM. But when we're ready to publish these to NPM, um, then we create what's called chain set. Um, and this states the what what um what packages in the mono repo um that are going to get uh, version bumped and um chain sets will will uh, create an email um, of what we will email everybody in the team um, of what the suggested team was so again there's no surprise everybody knows what's happening um and if we go back to our if with the tests pass and we're ready to deploy then chain sets will create a what's called a release pr so again this nothing's been released here but we, we it will create a pull request where it actually you can see what exactly versions are going to be bumped and another thing is what chain set does is it updates the change logs um or the release notes so again all that I've worked in many projects were the release notes or a record of what gets published are highly important. Um, it's highly important for to testers know what to test. Um, and I, I've seen this done manually. Uh, again, it, it's just it's just bugs waiting to happen. So chain sets will actually take care of releasing uh, of, of taking care of they'll update all the package JSON files and update all the relevant. Um, all all the relevant package JSON files for me. So there's again that we just got rid of the whole a whole uh, raft of bugs, and not only that, but it will get tagged. So this is hugely important as well. So it'll get tagged and create a new release um, if uh, release is uh, is applicable to your environment. So here's the mono repo in question. And you can see that there are releases for every single version change. But not only that, but this is really, really crucial when it comes to um, bug fixing. We need to be able to get, say we say our application is, we might have our, our application on several different environments, tests, there could be different versions of the code everywhere. Um, we if we get a bug in one of these versions, we don't want to be fixing it on the latest version every time because um, it, it might be fixed or the code could be vastly different. But one trick I like to do is, if it's a web app, is to put is to put an HTML, is to automate the insertion of a git commit um, hash into the, into the HTML. So then I can find out what version of the code I'm at from this git commit. And, if we're using something like you might have heard of Gitpod, then I can quickly have an environment to fix a bug by selecting the the Git tag, and then and I can use Gitpod to have a working version of the. I have an environment. I can spin up an environment that is ready for me to tackle a bug, so I don't. I'm, I'm not having to install things. Um, you can have a Gitpod YAML file, so it's custom to spin up. You can you can instantly be ready to fix a bug in your web browser. So 
again, that's a massive saving from where we've come uh, years ago. And, and I do expect this type of sort of transient developer, uh, this is here to stay. This is the old VS code, heavyweight, um, certainly not as heavy as some, um, is I, I think something that's going to seem quite antiquated in years to come. I, I do see this sort of ephemeral um, developer environment being more and more the, 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 the way forward. Uh, so the, the, the Git tagging and the creating releases again, it's something you shouldn't be going into your, your terminal and doing a Git tag and Git push tags. That, that's not, you're going to forget. If you're old like me, you're certainly going to forget. We automate the deployment. I mean, there's, there's just too many different ways to deploy code to go into great detail. Um, one thing I like to see as well is a smoke test. There's an automated smoke test, um, just one. So after every deployment, you want to check that your mission critical, the reason for the application exists, say you have a, an application that sells widgets. After every deployment, I want an end -to -end, see an end-to-end -end test that goes through the steps um, and, and buys a widget. So you, you want to smoke test your most critical piece of functionality you're not waiting for users to report bugs after every deployment. And it's easier to fix bugs when you know, you'll know exactly what version of the code's broken as well. Um, and tracking deployment metrics as well. Like we, we wanna know how we're doing. Um, it's important to, you know, if, if our build time's two hours, I mean, it's obviously, you, you try, you, you should be, should realize a long time ago that um, you have too big a build time. Um, I, I just want to mention that, that 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 PR was actually an example of being a good DX citizen. That was just to get rid of common JS. And because I got rid of common JS, I got rid of Webpack and I got rid of Jest. I was able to just migrate everything to Vite. Uh, and I think that's a good idea of DX hygiene. Um, the more code you have, the more problems you have. Um, I was able to bin a lot of code for Webpack loaders and plugins and all sorts of craziness to to server-side render React and just move the byte and have now one configuration file. It's ridiculously easy. Um, so next on our, our, our list is uh, is bug tracking uh, and, and resolution. Um, so this, this bit of advice I'm about to give you is worth the entrance fee alone. And that is the best way to stop creating bugs is don't write code that created bugs. Um, that is a, the best advice I, I'm going to give you today. Um, and I'm, of course, being facetious here, but not totally facetious. Um, I would say part of DX is to actually, is to actually stop bugs before they happen. We should be constant, and that go, we should be cognizant of, of, the, of the fact that any, any keystroke we make could actually um, be creating bugs. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, one thing I, I believe in is, is to use ESLint. I actually have my own, um, my own ESLint package here. So I have my base file here, and then I have ESLint rules that inherit this for Node, for React, for Angular. Uh, and then when it comes when it comes to to using these files, then it's any 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 other package that wants to consume these files. Um, it's just a, it's a one liner, so we're not copying and pasting a myriad of ESLint rules. And we have our own package that we have agreed in, in a team um, exactly what the ES, ESLint rules are. Um, and if we're using something like TypeScript, then we get instant feedback. So we can we can get we can get a we know after we know exactly. So we're here in JavaScript, this won't happen, and we'll be oblivious to the fact. But the TypeScript again is something that's becoming more and more mainstream. But it's DX is about this this constant feedback, uh, and I would even put uh, things like. My code formatting. So if you've ever, I've unfortunately worked in places where pedants would put 
comments and pull requests like your white space, you have too much white space here. Um, if we're using something like prettier, then you can have any formatting you want uh, as long as it's the one in the, uh, the ES lint rules. So again, this is not something we don't want developers to be wasting time um, formatting our code. Um, I have the development environment set up to run ES lint on every code, every code save. Um, and again, that we can stop a lot of bugs before they happen this way. Another, another uh, thing to bear in mind is I like to run performance tests on every commit to every pull request. We don't want to wait till suddenly senior manager come in screaming because it takes users have been have been complaining about it. it takes thirty seconds to bio for the for the bio widget page to load. I want to know on every commit to every pull request exactly where I stand as far as performance goes. And we can actually use these metrics here to fail the commit. Um, I used to use Lighthouse, it's maybe a bit clear here. So I've got some Lighthouse scores and, and this would actually result in a, a failed build because 59 is clearly not an acceptable for performance score. So again, this, this gets back to we're not we're not suddenly having to stop all production because we've suddenly realized our website is pig slow when it doesn't run on our Mac M2s. We know this sooner than later. Um, and that goes for security as well. Um, use things like the Mozilla uh, Observatory. Right? But they this website though. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, so I'd run this again on every commit and I would have a threshold. Um, you get a score here out of 100. So I would have a, I would fail a build if it's below, I don't know, up to you. Yeah, 75 or 100, that might be okay for some. Um, or you could fail it on certain rules. Certainly this code actually includes unsafe in line. It was using um, a CMS. Um, that did some, it used eval. So um, a lot of enterprises don't allow this. So again, I can catch this now. Uh, I'm not waiting. Um, I'm not waiting for uh, suddenly hit with a security audit of your, if you, you're, you're open to XSS attacks or something like that. We can tell a lot and we can run this as part of every commit. So we're totally um, on top of things. We, we know where we stand performance wise we know where we, we we can try our best to avoid any security headaches um, on every commit um and probably this i probably state in the obvious here so remove all ambiguity from bug reports i mean I, this is a good example we've got we've actually got a variable name or something here in the in the bug and there's just there's just not enough to go in here like i, I don't know Maria, I don't know anything about this. I'm going to have to ask more questions. I can't suddenly start working on this. Um, and this is an example of a good bug report. It's got the steps to reproduce. If it's a UI, a video, or an image, it probably works even better. But one thing I want to see in everything new tickets and also exit bug reports is acceptance criteria. Um, I want exact values that I can write unit tests against. So, here, the expected result is 15. So I want, we can use things like cucumber tables um, to get some really, really, really good um, examples. And this helps to remove the ambiguity from the work item tickets. We're using exact examples. I know exactly what's required here. Um, my code, as far as I know, works whenever I get this result. Um, don't see acceptance criteria enough on tickets, unfortunately, but it's probably my, the most important thing uh, for me, where possible. Um, then we can move testing. Again, this is something I have seen grow horribly, horribly wrong recently. The upsurge in the want to write thousands of end-to-end -end tests um, in Selenium or Cypress or something uh, is unfortunately, I think just doomed to failure. Um, we used to talk about years ago a lot about a testing pyramid where the you have a very, so tests, the, the higher up the pyramid you go, the 
the higher the price of maintainability of your test. So an end-to-end -end test written in Selenium touches a lot of real resources. And you don't, the more of these you have, the higher your maintenance budget. So we should have very, very, very few of these. I would only ever test the happy path, um, not the exceptional path with um, end-to-end -end tests. Um, for that reason, because um, they're high. And the lower down, so if, if we want to test, say, um, validation, then that's a unit test. I mean, you shouldn't be spinning up a real web browser to test that you can, your, your form input um, accepts um, only valid email addresses. Um, I, unfortunately, I've, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I've worked on projects where one, where one project where every new functionality had to have a backing end to end test. Um, and that only lasted so long. We had a two hour build, um, we had flaky tests, and most of those flaky tests ended up in the bin. So it was a massive waste of, uh, of effort. Uh, uh, yeah, the, unfortunately, um, this has this has really, yeah, I, 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 I really put me off end end testing, but the uh, you definitely need some, I'd say again, to test your critical functionality. Um, one thing less to mention in the tenants of good DX is a good developer environment. I mean, you should be using, I'm a big believer in mono repos and um, using tools such as PMPM and Turbo Repo. Turbo Repo is a good tool for incremental builds so you're not building everything from scratch each time. So with, with good with good cutting edge technology, you get good developers and you get good developers who want to stay. If good developers are looking over their shoulder at what Bob is doing in his job or he's using uh, technology X, um, then, and, and you're still on, I don't know, whatever, you're, you, you could have I, I don't believe in totally cutting edge, but you should, you should have, you should be using the latest tools that make sense. Don't, don't, don't invite change just for change sake to keep the cool kids. Um, but it's important. You, the, there are good tools out there and they can make your developer environment um, much a, a much slicker affair um, if you use them wisely. Um, and I think I've really talked enough for now. So um, uh, if, but back to you, Jack. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation, Paul. Um, I learned a lot. One thing I was just curious about was just some like common mistakes that you see developers make when they're going through a dev cycle. What you know, if you could have like the top three things that you recommend people make sure uh, they don't do, what would you say that would be? Yeah, I mean, the, probably the most. I mean, it's e easier to always nice to recommend a flash new tool, but I think communication, especially now in the uh, in the more often than remote post COVID world, I think communications is 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 often done terribly, I, but badly specified. If anything that's ambiguous can send pe people off to work in a day or so, um, yeah, a day or so without. It can take time to actually track down the fact that so so there's not enough focus and a lot of this I see on actually working software. I would like. Rather than seeing, there should be like should should be presentations of working software. Should be it should be always about showing working software, mm -hmm. and that you know, and it's also something it's a chance to show off. I've been working on this. Like I I don't think the focus the focus seems to have drifted away from that uh, in in my experience. Like it should it should always be about showing where you are. We we know where we are because of where the software is. Any any time we commit code, it should go into. Every time we merge a pull request it should be automated into an environment where somebody can take a click and look exactly where we are. And just on the note of automation, are there any use cases where you don't recommend automation or where people kind of overlook certain things when they're uh, automating their testing? That's a great. Oh, well, automated, automated testing, I, I, I think, is, is often... Well, it's far, for, for automa automated testing is one of something I, I think I, I rarely... I've never seen done well. I don't think I, I put my, I think manual test, there is no, we haven't replaced manual testing. What automation testing should be for is 
a tester goes in, does manual testing, and then on the back of that, we then write manual tests. So they're not having to do that every time. But a lot of times I see people going straight for the for the automated test before they've done the uh, the discovery work. And in your experience, what, what's the thing that, um, I mean, it might be this, it might be that, but what, what's the thing that really slows the dev cycle down and just causes issues? Is it communication, automated testing, a bit of both, neither? Um, yeah, well, yeah, the, well, definitely, um, too, well, yeah, too, too, many, too many manual steps, um, bugs, bugs, too many bugs, you should really, you should put war, I mean, if, if you're getting too much, if you're constantly having to fight fires, um, and fight, fighting infrastructure and fighting bugs, yeah, anything that takes you away from um, working in features, like, which is the whole point, you should, you should have a, a strategy, like, like something like being able to easily spin up an environment, being able to recreate a bug as fast as you can there should be a process and stuff that like you shouldn't have to be um trying to update docker files and change things and scratching around frantically trying to get an environment you should it should really be as as painless as possible to recreate the bug and you should do your damnedest to um, make that possible all right um i think that's all my questions i'd just like to thank you again for your excellent presentation and just a note to all of our attendees today um the webinar will be posted on youtube and i'll also be sending a follow-up email so you'll have everything you need um and that will include any relevant links or information that paul feels um should be uh, uh sent over to you folks um so paul thank you once again um and i hope Cheers. we can uh, have another webinar with you in the future Great. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.